Hi everyone, welcome to Dressing for a Non-Car Commute Part 1. This is going to be a series that's part of Bike Week, and today is part one of three, and we are going to cover all the basics on how to dress for a non-car commute. Well, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Jessica Fole Paisley, and I am the founder and style professional with PS Styling. I work with clients on an individual basis, on a professional image level, and across the board uh, to do styling on uh an appearance level, and then also for productions where I have styled for a purpose or a theme uh, for independent films and kind of a variety of scenarios. The mission of my business is to create opportunities for empowerment through image and style. So again, whether that's on an individual level, a professional level, or if it's through a variation of storytelling, really what I do is work with individuals or work with clients to uh, express emotions through your clothing. I'm going to give you just a quick background on the difference between a fashion stylist and an image consultant, which I tend to do a little bit of both, which is why I call myself a style professional. A fashion stylist works with clients on that commercial level, production level, ads, and really is trying to go for a specific look and feel, and that tells a story. It sends a message. Whereas an image consultant, uh, we work with the client on an individual basis. So what colors look best on you, how things fit. Um, how they feel focused on the individual, on everything from appearance, behavior, uh, to communications. The old rule when it came to styling and anything appearance-wise was that first impressions were made within the first 30 seconds of meeting someone new. So the focus was appearance was over 50%, tone of voice, and then also eye contact all came into play there. The new rule is that first impressions are made within two seconds. And this is based on some studies that have been done and featured in the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. And really in those first two seconds, we are, it's called thin slicing and we're unintentionally making decisions on people anywhere from their age, sex, socioeconomic status, race, occupation, personality, and even their character. So we're kind of making these snap decisions and judgments. So when I'm working with a client, we take all of those things into consideration that that goes into um, whether it's fair or not. And it's it's a subconscious thing. We are unconsciously and subconsciously making decisions on people based on um, that frontward facing appearance. This is an example I like to share because when you first look at the photo, so I have three different photos provided here. Uh, this is a woman and her name is Lynn, Lynn Slater. And she goes by the Instagram handle accidental icon. I really like her story because it just goes to show how different, uh, how you put yourself together and how your appearances can be um, understood by different people. So she, her background is she attended a New York fashion week and happened to be in the audience and was waiting for a friend to meet with her. And while she was waiting, a photographer started taking photos of her. After that photographer started taking photos of her, others took notice and started taking photos as well. And long story short, she became an overnight sensation, an accidental icon because of the perception of what other people thought she was. Um, thought she was somebody famous, thought she was a designer, whatever the case may be. Uh, she be became um, that accidental icon and gained notoriety right away based on others' perceptions. So what does she actually do? She is a social work professor. So it's really interesting. She's somebody who in her day job, it does something completely different than what people perceived her to do. And I really like to share this story because it's just something different. She, now she is a professor. Uh, now she does blogging. Um, she does uh, fashion blogging, works with different companies, has been featured in covers of different magazines. And again, now considers an ac herself an accidental icon based on um, that experience. As a style professional and working with the different groups that I've worked with, I try to break down how I work with my clients in three different ways. So the reason I'm telling you this for a non-car non commute is so that way you have the foundation for styling um, in this part one of the series. And then part two and three will go a little bit more into different fabrications and why you should wear what um, you need for utility purposes. And then also... Uh, we'll do some interviews with people who do uh, regularly um, commute in a non-car fashion and see what they wear. So when I'm talking to clients, I talk about uh, perception first. So perception is what I was describing earlier with what happened to Lynn is how others perceive you. So when I, I always like to joke when I give presentations, I can't go anywhere again in flip flops or anything casual because 
of how others can perceive that. And, you know, really as a walking brand for my company, giving off that perception um, as a style professional is important. The second part is style. So the individual piece. So how we view ourselves, the things we'll wear, the things we won't wear, the reasons behind why we wear them, uh, being comfortable in them, for example. And then A is aesthetics. So what looks best? So this is what an image consultant would tell you actually looks best on you um, from your hair color, eye color, skin tone, uh, body shape, what you do on your daily, do on a daily basis. So all the things that would actually look best on you. So again, it's PSA, so perception, style, and aesthetics. As I mentioned, perception is how others view us. So when thinking about what your, and this goes into your daily dress code. So thinking about on the professional level, who is your audience? Um, society has unfortunate standards and different stereotypes across the board. So just being aware of them. Again, I'm not saying you have to follow them exactly, but being aware of them is definitely helpful um, to make sure that you at least know what you could potentially be up against. Uh, there's a lot of just in general for women specifically, it goes across the board for men and women, but uh, makeup and hair, those are fir the first things that people see. And so when you're thinking about a non-car commute, uh, you're probably not gonna be able to do your hair the way you typically would or wear makeup that you normally would. And those are things that we'll talk about in the next two parts on how you can um, minimize what uh, your look would be and basically have something very simple that you can you can bring to work with you and then complete getting ready. And then for men, a lot of the hair care, and if you do wear um, and have anything as far as moisturizers, things along those lines, and then even facial hair grooming will all come into play. The area that I really wanted to focus on today is talking about uh, color psychology and based on what you wear, how that will affect your mood and how it will affect how others perceive you. I find this just so fascinating because You'll see this when you look at different websites or graphic designers will do this. Uh, even if you go into a spa, for example, there are intentional colors in there to make you feel a certain way. So blue, blue is a really popular color. Basically, it is the most popular color. Uh, you find this across the board, whether it's all the way from light blue to dark blue, but it's connected with wisdom and trustworthiness and really gives off that stable feeling. So blue is a great color just across the board. You can see with the blue background um, that we have here that it just gives you more of a calm, serene feeling. Obviously white, that goes into kind of the purity and other tones that it's connected with. And there's a reason that it's connected with that. Uh, you can go into any spas or um, again, places that are meant to have that healing kind of effect. And there's different variations of white that's chosen for that particular reason. Purple, one of my personal favorite colors, is the power, a color of power and luxury, um, creativity. You'll see this a lot in different groups that I've given presentations to. If it's a traditionally creative group like graphic designers or even hairstylists, you'll see purple kind of pops up quite a bit. And I love seeing when I'm looking into a crowd or looking into a group of people, what colors they're wearing kind of based on their personality, what, what they want to evoke. And I'm not even sure that they're sharing that. Yellow. Yellow is a great color. This is actually a color for you to wear when you're doing your non-car commute because the yellows and oranges are all colors that are considered uh, more energetic and they're connected with joy and happiness, energy. Uh, as I was mentioning with orange, um, it's very, you see this in like um, fitness a lot in health or fitness based places. It shares excitement and passion and it's really a combination between yellow and red, which red is a color of passion, not always one of the colors that you want to wear, say, for an interview, but it is a great color to wear for um, that kind of energizing side of things. Now, pink, you know, pink is one of those colors that, again, is viewed as uh, more of a soft or trustworthy type color. And there are so many other staple pieces, so like the browns and the grays and the blacks. Those are always just foundational pieces. So what I wanted to share with you today was just a little bit more of the colors and how they will affect uh, how others perceive you, just to have that background and knowledge, but also how you act. So when you're wearing oranges, when you're wearing yellows, 
um, even when you're wearing green, green is one of the colors that is um, connected with like vitality and um, it's a great color to wear for an interview because green is connected with money. So people think of you as giving them um, financial stability or growth. So these are all just subtle things that come along, um, come along in line with color theory in general. So good foundation to start with. Understand your colors, know those. And when you're getting dressed, you can dress appropriately to subconsciously tell yourself to be excited and have energy. So we've talked about the P, the perception. Now is individual, the individual style. So all of us have an individual style. Even if we say we don't have a style, that's an individual style. And it, most of it's based on how we grew up, where we grew up. For me, I love to give the example that I grew up in a farm right outside of Dubuque and I had town clothes and I had home clothes and my home clothes were utility clothes because they were connected with doing chores. So I was always excited to dress up into my town clothes because that gave me a chance to get dressed up and to wear some things that I thought were more fun, more fun or pretty or whatever the case may be. But those are all things that come into play. So if maybe you only wore utility clothes, it's hard for you to dress up or hard for you to see purpose of dressing up. These can be things that come into our subconscious when we're um, even trying to dress professionally for and match a dress code. So the why we wear what we wear, how it makes us feel, uh, wearing something that's comfortable, that fits you well, that you feel good in is going to completely impact um, what you're wearing. So if you're wearing something for your non-car commute that is uncomfortable or it's binding or feels too tight or just makes you feel like you're overheating, all of those things are going to be important to whether or not you actually continue um, to, to do this for the rest of the week. Uh, we all have patterns of what we wear when you look in your closet. You're going to have something that's either uh, very, um, has some continuity to it, or just across the board looks, um, you see patterns in your own clothing, or you'll have some, even having no pattern at all is considered a pattern if you have just sporadic stuff because you're trying to find what you want, but you haven't quite nailed it down yet. So there are also emotional responses for example, if you have something that you wore your favorite blazer on your first job interview, and so from then on, you've always connected with, and you've received the job, you always connected a blazer with uh, professionalism and, and being successful. So those are things that are connected into our individual style that gives us an emotional response. And then, of course, the most common is comfort zone. The things that you always go back to, you probably have five to 10 pieces that are your old faithfuls, no matter what. And so how can you be aware of what those are and maybe find pieces that will mimic that um, comfort zone? That way you'll wear new pieces more frequently. And then finally, the A, the, is the aesthetics. What actually looks best on us? So what colors look best on us and why? Even though there are colors out there based on color theory that will um, emote of uh, excuse me, invoke different emotions, there are colors that actually look best on us. So I'm considered in the grand scheme of things, a winter, if you were looking at the different seasons and different colors. So colors that look best on me are high contrast, very saturated, reds, blues, emeralds, jewel tones. Um, and each of you will fall in different categories and just kind of knowing which, which look best on you aesthetic wise also helps. So Knowing that, plus your body type, um, things that are going to feel more comfortable on you, uh, things that are going to not be too long or too short without having to get altered. You know, a lot of things, people think that there's no con actual like ready to wear look. I would always suggest alterations. Getting something altered makes it fit the best to whatever your body type might be. Um, knowing your lifestyle. Are you somebody who dresses up and goes out quite a bit? Or do you like to stay at home and, you know, everybody's staying at home right now? And what is your lifestyle? Are you wanting to wear something that's more on a comfort basis or have something that has some structure to it that you can feel like you're dressed up when you're doing a Zoom call? Um, and then now with being able to, things are getting warmer, being out uh, and doing stuff and having this non-car commute, that will be part of incorporating it into your lifestyle. And then of course, budget. Uh, anything that we consider uh, style wise, I always ask people what their budget is and where they want to start. So I'm a big fan of thrifting and secondhand styling and finding things that can be repurposed. So in part two and three of the series, we'll talk a little bit more of that and just knowing your budget in general. So if you have something that you want to purchase and um, invest in, that it's going to be quality and that it'll be long term for you. 
So what we just discussed are the P, the S, and the A. So PSA, perception, style, and aesthetics. And those are your foundational tools to use when thinking about what you are wanting to prepare for your non-car commute. And honestly, these tools will uh, go hand in hand with anything that you um, put together going forward style-wise. One of my favorite quotes is by Judith Rathband. She is um, one of the most, um, I would say, influential stylists or image consultants in the industry. And one is one of the founders of the industry in general. The way we dress affects the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, and the way others react to us. So take all that into consideration when you are planning out your looks for your non-car commute, when you're getting dressed for your dress code, um, for work, and kind of anything in between. Uh, thank you for being part of this conversation with me today and stay tuned for part two and part three of the series for Bike Week. And I look forward to speaking with you soon.